So, how lean does somebody have to be in order to reap the benefits of peri workout nutrition? Ah, that's a very good question. How lean do they need to be? Well, leanness can be an indicator of insulin sensitivity. And the more insulin sensitive you are, the better that's going to work for you. Um, however, I would say this. Just by training itself, the act of training, um, mechanical tension on the muscle, you just by doing that, you're going to get what's called uh, non-insulin non mediated glute transfer, glute four translocation. So, you know, normally when you think about insulin, you think about driving nutrients into cells, whether it be fat cells or muscle cells. And um, when your insulin levels rise, uh, your cells' response is carrier proteins are made and they go to the cell membrane and allow glucose uh, actually in. Um, that actually happens just from training itself, though. So I don't want to. I don't want your listeners to think, well, I get pretty fat when I eat carbs, so I probably shouldn't do it. Because you also have that element of training itself that can help drive nutrients into. So meaning, meaning it would still be beneficial for somebody with a higher body fat level, assuming they're not too high, to to use it around training because your insulin resistance train changes when you train. I think so. I think so. What I would do, though, is I would lower carbs during the other parts of the day. Um, right. And that's going to kind of prime that response a little better anyway. So it'll be kind of a complementary approach. Whereas if somebody's leaner, you know, they could eat carbs every meal, you know. So yeah, sure. I would try to, um, you know, insulin sensitivity is one of the biggest keys to this whole thing that we do bodybuilding. It really is. And the more you can optimize that, the more you can grow. And it wasn't until probably four years ago that I really <clears throat> started studying it and trying to understand it. I wish I would have started studying it a long time ago, to be honest with you. So what about we've got people that are pretty lean and still pretty resistant. Is that atypical? Yes. Or is that, Well, it, <clears throat> okay. I, I have one guy I'm thinking of. In like, bodybuilding, it's not because I'm assuming that some of those folks are using growth hormone. Yes. And growth hormone itself causes glucose resistance. Right. If okay. you, uh, especially, you know, anecdotally, what I see is, especially when you split up the doses, when you start doing two and three doses a day, mm. that's when people, they get leaner, they get really lean and hard. But mm -hmm. they'll say, man, I just can't get that pump I used to get. And, my, you know, I don't quite have. I just, or no amount of insulin does anything to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, all you know, the eight units that used to make them hypo, you know, they've, they've introduced insulin. They've used it. They've used it. And they've used it. Now it takes 20 to 25 units to even come right. to getting a response. Right. And then they have to sit around until anything happens. Yeah, that's um, that's the challenge is, you know, you, you know, you put insulin in to counteract that. Some people use glucophage to counteract it. That uh, you know, I talked to Doctor Serrano about glucophage before. We've mm -hmm. actually had a lot of a lot of discussions on it, and I asked him exactly what the mechanism was for it to work. And I asked him, does it make insulin receptors more sensitive that sit on the cell membrane? And it seems to. He said, you know, that's a strong theory, um, and it's actually one of the oldest medications. It's been around forever. Um, they don't know for sure, but that's where the data points right. um, a lot of people use it before a cheat meal and they you know if they have a cheat meal like for instance before they go to bed right. um, then they wake up and they report that they're nice and full and vascular so that tells me physiologically something's happening you've got to think long term this is the problem with a lot of studies nowadays is they focus on the, the acute response not mm -hmm. the chronic response cortisol for instance we know right. we need some cortisol acutely. We need we know we need some inflammation acutely, but we don't want it chronically. We don't want chronically high inflammation and chronically high levels of cortisol. We know that, and this is where this is where the whole topic of peri workout nutrition is incredibly skewed and incredibly misrepresented, as far as I'm concerned. Everybody's focused on protein synthesis. Well, you know, it's 24 to 48 hours that protein synthesis is. 
uh, alive and well. I 100% agree with that. But you're only looking at a small part of the puzzle, okay? There's other pieces to this that you got to look at. Now, if you take this endomorph, for instance, I personally think the more you weight train, the better, as long as you can tolerate it. Weight training will always top cardio for me in terms of getting someone in shape. It always will. Um, so, <clears throat> so how do you do that? How do you enable yourself to train five, six, up to seven days a week? Some people train even more. My opinion is that this is best accomplished through, uh, I'm going to assume a very good diet's already in place. And once that happens, intra-workout nutrition can very, it can manage muscle protein breakdown very well. You know, so you, you always have this equation, muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. And you always want synthesis to, to obviously be higher than breakdown. Right. But muscle protein breakdown, and this, this occurs especially in fasted training, muscle protein breakdown can, can get pretty out of control. And I use this analogy in every seminar I do. If you're digging a ditch, okay, and you dig it five feet deep, meaning muscle protein breakdown, you've got to build it back up five feet just to get where you were. Right. Not, that doesn't mean you got better. That was just to get where you were. So what if, what if you only dug the ditch one feet deep? Then all of a sudden it becomes, okay, well, now I can pile on two or three feet, and I'm in, I'm in an accretion. I'm in a positive uh, in, that, in that equation. And this is what I see. I see certain nutrients. 95% of the supplements out there are crap. But there are certain nutrients that this seems to work really, really well with. And I've been obsessed with this for a long time. And when you limit muscle protein breakdown, all of a sudden you're not that sore anymore. You're like, holy cow. Man, I could go in and do legs again. I just did them two days ago. Then all of a sudden, you, it's amazing. You know, I, I, wish I, would, I wish I would have saved every email I got about this because I can guarantee you I would have at least 1,000. Right. These emails all say the same thing. John, I didn't think this was even possible. How am I training this hard? I'm not getting sore. So anecdotally, this is very powerful evidence for me. It wasn't one person. It wasn't just me. I'm talking hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people. Um, and there's also, there's also, uh, Scott Stevenson just wrote a, wrote a paper for me that's going to be on my website here in a week or two about cortisol and intra workout nutrition tends to, uh, reduce chronic, chronically high cortisol levels that are the result of training really, really intensely. Right. And what this study showed, it was really cool. Muscle fibers were actually, they took, they took people the one group they gave them intra workout nutrition, one group they didn't, and uh, they didn't just look at the acute response. The acute response didn't show anything significant, but they went back and they they continued to mine data that or they continued to accumulate data and they looked at it later, and the people who were using intra workout nutrition actually had larger muscle fibers. There, oh, they actually the uh, what's it called the cross sectional? I can't think of the acronym for it, but the the size of the muscle fiber in the folks that used intra-workout nutrition was actually bigger, and they had much lower cortisol levels in the long run. Not in the short run, but in the long run. Right. Um, I think in five years from now, you're going to hear, hopefully, uh, you'll start to see people do a little bit better studies, and there'll be a little better data out there. So well, that's how bodybuilding works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, I take a lot of heat all the time because... I tell people, you know, I think it's very possible for us to be ahead of the curve. And I don't see why that's such a hard concept for people to understand. Uh, no. You know, hopefully, I mean, you can tell by talking to me, I love the scientific part of this. I really do. But I'm not um, handcuffed by it, you know. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people that are that are handcuffed by it. And they, they're kind of, a, I call it being a slave to science. They can't think outside the box. And what I like to have people do. Creatures a habit too, right? They don't want to. Yeah, they don't. They don't want to stop doing something that might be working, right? In order to right. do something else. I mean, the bottom line is, is, um, you know, we all have a different response to different things. However, there's certain basic physiology that, you know, you can, you know, you can certainly influence um, by how you're eating, when you're eating, what you're eating. I mean, I just think that's common sense, but. Um, 
So anyways, it's a really cool subject. I love I could talk about it all day. I've seen a post where you talked about client a couple of clients in a row a few months ago that were very dry and conditioned and you would note that there were no diuretics used. Um, when, if at any time, are diuretics actually useful and when would you opt not to use them? Well, first of all, I would tell you that I've used about every diuretic possible. So I'm not going to stand here on a soapbox and pretend that I'm a savior and that diuretics are easy. A lot of people are in that boat and nobody really knows how to use them properly because how, how many people have tried all the permutations possible? Right. Well, the, the thing is, is that saying that there's a right way to use them is, in, in my opinion, is foolish because they're so unpredictable. I mean, right. you have to factor in things like your stress level to show. You have to mm -hmm. factor in uh, whether you're being there nine hours, ten hours waiting, right? Nine, ten hours waiting. Uh, maybe you're sitting there sweating. Maybe, maybe you didn't sleep that well, and you were up later than you're usually up. There's so many factors that can come into it. It's really hard to get it just right. So, first of all, if I it's a lot easier when you're sitting home. Yeah, I mean, when you sit home, you know, you can really calculate everything, and you know, you try to do, you try. My philosophy is, I try to get people in shape two weeks out from a show, and I try to do. When when a person says to me, "This is how I want to look on stage," I do my best to duplicate what they're doing to replicate that result. I mean, this is what I do personally. You know, I'm in pretty good shape now. I'm five weeks out, I would say that probably two or three weeks out, I'll be good enough in my mind, to step on stage and look the way I want to look. So what I do is I look at, okay, what exactly am I doing right now? And I try to repeat it. Um, there are things that you got to account for, though. You know how sometimes the last couple of days your metabolism takes off? Um, so there's also things like that you have to account for. The last time I used a diuretic was at Nationals in 2002. It was in Dallas. And I used a half a diazide. That was my diuretic protocol. But I didn't stop drinking and I actually ate a lot of salty think, food the night before. Yeah, I think that both of those things are key. Well, yeah. if you're not using a diuretic, do you feel you have to pull water a lot harder? Or is it... You know, some people are a little drier looking naturally um, more sure. than others. So when you factor that in, let's say you take a guy who's not dry looking. Um, what's interesting is some people respond better to drinking more the night before as opposed to less. So... I've got a, I don't think I've ever shared this, but I should probably share it on Facebook. I've got a guy that is a good illustration of this. He did, he did, uh, we did his trial run, and I had him drink X amount of water. I don't know what it was. Let's just say it was three gallons of water. And we looked at him the next day. Then we kept all factors the same. And then the following week, we did one more trial run. But instead of taking his water from two to three gallons on Friday, we took it from two to one, which is classically what people do. Sure. He looked much better at three gallons, much better. I had side by side pictures, and his just flattened out way too much. Flattened out yeah. way too much. His muscle was fuller. His lines were deeper. Um, yeah. You know, I also coached a guy that won the uh, Mr. Ohio last year, and he was dry as a bone. He was a hundred times harder than anybody in that show, and he didn't take any diuretics. And with him, I did shut it off at like nine. That was the one I saw. That was the post I saw. Yeah, yeah. Mark looked fantastic, and uh, with him. You know, I did shut off water pretty much at, you know, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and he was on stage the next morning for prejudging. So even then, it wasn't real drastic. Mm. But um, no, That's not drastic at all. I don't think that's drastic. You know, I remember... No, I was I mean, back in the day, 10 years ago, we were dropping water on Thursday or Wednesday night yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and then just sitting around like, yeah, for two days, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing of the past. Hope. Oh yeah, I used to man, I used to do the same anymore. thing. I used to shut off water on Friday, and I would take. Uh, this is when I was in my twenties, and I would take a Lasix tab, and right. um, I would wake up, and my head would be throbbing. Oh God, yeah. My when I pose, my lower back would be cramped and tight, and I was winning shows. Uh, right. And what I thought was, well, this must be the way to do it. You know, mm -hmm. I must be doing it right, but I just didn't know any better. You know, I was winning shows because I was lean. It wasn't moving more onto diet. Um, I always see pictures and, and posts that you have about healthy fats like coconut oils, and I don't even have any others because. Oh yeah, I do. I got some organic butter. Yeah. <laughs> I got omega eggs in the 
the fridge. I'm not going to take those out. So I always see these these posts on this, but then the updates for athletes are always this guy's at 500 grams of carbs or 400 grams or 600 grams of carbs. It never tells us how much fat they're eating. Yeah. So I find that really peculiar, and I want to know <laughs> like what kind of diet philosophy you've had you have that you know it obviously everybody's different but you're including these fats when well you know um, first of all um, i like healthy fat a lot and i think it's crucial to obviously the hormonal health and all kinds of things however people get this impression that i'm feeding people sticks of butter and that is right that is, oh, i kind of got that impression you like, know it's not true and i'll give you an example like I, um, one of the pros that I worked with, I had him use coconut oil at one tablespoon to cook his eggs in in the morning. Which is a lot to cook eggs in. You know, and that is a lot. It actually was, yeah, no, actually, I, you know what? I, it was a teaspoon. It wasn't a tablespoon, it was a teaspoon. I've been using a teaspoon and it's a lot. What, seven grams of fat, I think? It was a, but it was a teaspoon. And, and, yep. you know, he put a, you know, he put a post up and with his picture of coconut oil and everybody was like, oh my God, how much of that? It was a teaspoon. That right. it. Okay. But then there's the Poliquin articles that are all about, you know, cook your whole omega eggs in your butter and your organic butter, and, and you, you start to think, well, that's like 30 grams of fat for breakfast. Yeah, you know, it's not that bad, though. Um, <clears throat> here, here's what I here's the pattern I typically use with people. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on a training day, I don't intend for this to happen. It just usually happens. If I break down the macros, it usually comes out to 40, 40, 20, 20% 20 being fat. So it's like the zone diet. Yeah, and I don't even intend for it to happen. Um, what happens is once I stack their nutrition around training with carbs, the other meals are <clears throat> much lower in carbs and have mm -hmm. a little bit of fat. And when I say a little bit, it might be the fat might be – uh, the fat that's in a sirloin. They might have sirloin and veggies. Sure. Or their breakfast might be three eggs, um, you know, maybe a half a cup of egg whites. Or their, you know, maybe they have, um, you know, chicken, and there's a couple grams of fat in chicken. But my my point is, is that once I build a plan, it usually on training days almost always works out to 40, 40, 20. And I don't even mean for it to. And then on the off days when they don't train, I typically take carbs down a little, and I take fat up some. When I say mm -hmm. up some, <clears throat> that 20% might become 30%. Um, right. So I like to use fats, but I'm not bombing people with fat. I'm putting what I think is a nice amount for health. Right. Um, so you're not trying to get people into ketosis by any means. Hell no. I am right. I am not. Um, I, I am not. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say I'm anti-anything, but I'm really not a fan of keto diets in the long term um for yeah I mean, in the long couple, term i think they can cause problems a kind of corollary to that was somebody asked a question about um when they're in a highly androgenic state yep using more androgenic products than anabolic um you see a lot of people talking about high carb diets with very low fat but this particular <laughs> poster said that he um, actually, I want to screenshot, share it with you here in a second. Um, he goes with some pretty high-fat, low-carb diets, when, even when using a lot of androgens, and he do doesn't want to make a mistake here. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Tell me when you can see that. It should be about five seconds. Okay. Um, there we go. Yeah. It says, Mountain Dog, can you please let me know why fat loss is inhibited by the body that is in a very androgenic state. Now, I didn't understand the question, so I clarified it later. Um, but what he's saying is he, he was always told to avoid fats and because it impedes fat loss. And he's dieting and using a higher f fat intake and very low carbs. In fact, this is one of my clients, and at one point we were at 47 grams of carbs a day, yeah. just pre-training. And... Uh, but he doesn't want to hinder his fat loss unknowingly. So I, I thought this was a really good question it, because it, yeah, it is certain products will just make you eat carbs and you just burn them. You burn them and you burn them. Um, is that a mistake to to try this type of diet? Well, here yeah. here's what I would tell you: if something's working awesome, 
stick with it because damn it, it's hard enough to find plans that work awesome. But I'll say this: Do you know what? In my opinion, you know what really impedes fat loss is too many calories. It's not too many fat grams. It's not too many carbs. It's too many calories overall. So if I have somebody that feels better on lower carbs, believe me, I have a lot of people on lower carb diets too. But sure. it's for a reason. You know, they feel better on lower carbs. So we might just do what, like what you're doing. We might provide them pre-workout and intra-workout just to manage that muscle protein break. Yeah, you start to wonder if you're – messing with things at that point or you know if you if you should be eating more carbs so that was that was what that question was. well and the other thing i would say is when people just say eating fat uh slows down fat loss that's a that's a there's so much more to that first of all yeah. the the structure of fats is not all the same you have short chain fats you have medium chain fats long chain right we were using almost entirely um coconut oil yeah okay so your liver isn't even going to need to produce bile salts to break that down it's used right right so and there was maybe three egg yolks in a day yeah and that was it there was not even any red meat yeah so you know you also got to look at the structure of the fat um you know i i i again i go back to what impedes fat loss in my opinion is poor calorie planning i just saw a study that uh, another coach had put up, which was he was talking about there's almost no amount of protein that you can eat where you become fat, and I completely disagreed with it. Um, I just felt like that was just a really long route to creating glycogen and then storing it as fat. Yeah, glu- uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, <clears throat> you know, what I would say to that is, which is silly, first of all, um, if you didn't eat any carbs or any fat, you know what? It probably would be hard enough to get your calories up, but again, it's a matter of calories. But wouldn't that just stress your system so much? You wouldn't. Even... Well, I tell you what. If you want to get nice and constipated and poison your system, that's exactly yeah. what I would do. And catabolic, I think, right? Well, I mean, that's you know, maybe not technically, but it just feels like that would be horrible. The, the lack of fat will eventually affect you hormonally. It will. Right. Okay. The lack of carbs. You know, even though people say carbs aren't essential, and they're not. The lack of carbs, in my opinion, could very well have an adverse effect on someone's thyroid down the road. Maybe not, a, maybe not short term, mm. but long term. Um, our bodies aren't meant to go zero carb and zero fat. I, I just don't sure. believe that. And I get tired of hearing these cavemen arguments. I'm like, what the hell? Last time I remember, cavemen weren't training the way we train, and. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't it's the silly. Same I keep hearing people say, "Well, that's not how cavemen ate." Oh, I don't remember any cavemen been in the nineteen, you know, whatever, Mister Olympia either. You know, it's a silly framework to use. Um, it, that's just my opinion. A lot of people disagree with me on that, but all right. So, Physi- physiology on. evolves. You know, sure. No, well, no, human physiology no. evolves. You know, it, it just does. You look at different parts of the globe and how people eat differently um is one better than the other no their bodies have just adjusted uh, and evolved to fit you know people in africa eat different than people in Ar- Ar- antarctica who eat different than people in asian countries i mean sure. you know i mean can you imagine I, I, trying to completely change the diets of um you know uh, people on an, like in antarctica <laughs> Yeah, like Inuits. Yeah, yeah, no, it wouldn't. yeah, it wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, so, so assuming that there's this physiology that is everyone is uniform and equal is kind of crazy. Okay, next question: How important is HGH to competitive sports, particularly bodybuilding, and is there a dose that's too high or too low? Um, well, for you know, everybody has a little different tolerance levels, and it's, what's always interesting to me is um, is the whole blood pressure thing. A lot of people hold a, a, a water with certain compounds and some people don't i'm one of those people that i don't hold any water at all but i never use you it have, this chinese. you don't have an intestine <laughs> yeah i don't have a colon either that probably but even even when i had my colon intact i still yeah. never really held a lot of water um and you know i i remember um you know full disclosure i remember trying chinese growth hormone 
um, years and years and years ago. And I remember my blood pressure for the first time in my life shot up and was sky high. I get this question a lot. People ask me, is it, is it better to have no growth hormone or Chinese? And a lot of times I do say it's better to have something um, for bodybuilding, but for health, absolutely not. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, I actually um, have a script for it so I can talk about it. I, I just use Pharma GH myself. Um, yeah. I will never... I will never use Chinese stuff ever, ever. I would much rather not use anything at all than use Chinese stuff. Yeah, I, th I think as I get older and I have a child and everything, it's just not I, – I wouldn't risk it um, health-wise. It just doesn't make sense. But, like, is there – you hear stories of guys that are, you know, at the upper level of the sport using 36 IUs a day. Yeah, that's absolutely true, yeah. I'm sure it is true. Yeah. But, like – how? Well, how, how do you, I can tell you exactly how they do it. They take a bottle of Sarastim in the morning and a bottle of Sarastim at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know guys yeah, that do this. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess I guess that's true. Uh, it's just, uh, I guess it just seems like the money aside, because that's irrelevant. I think, you know, anyone can make money and be able to spend it. So that's, that's, uh, that's irrelevant. But just from a pure comfort standpoint, it just seems... Horrible. Yeah, I I don't think I'd feel too good doing that either. <laughs> yeah. The guys that I know that um, some of the guys that I know that use doses like that are pretty broken down now. I mean, yeah. If you saw them now, how bad they hobble around. I mean, they're pretty yeah. broken down. It's actually pretty sad. Yeah, no, it's true. And I I remember on the Chinese stuff, I couldn't walk downstairs for a while. Yeah. Like, I don't know what was different about it, but it was like. I imagine if you ran enough of it for long enough, it would just be your hips and your joints would just be a mess. Yeah, yeah. That's it's funny because a low dose can make your joints feel wonderful, but then yeah, you start jacking the dose up and your joints feel like they're going to snap. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing three for a year now, and I don't see much of a drop off, and it's I feel great. The the first time, um, and I, I told my my friends know this. The first time I ever used GH was. Um, I was in my second pro qualifier, so I had already won state and regional shows, and I used um, ten a week, two IU's of Umatrope, five to, after training, five days a week. It was ten IU's a week, and it was mm -hmm. amazing. And um, I started hearing about these guys that were doing nine, ten, fifteen. Right, eight. right. I was like, man, that's crazy. I did two IUs, and it was this was crazy good. It was awesome. Yeah. But, uh, well, how, how old were you then? Well, it was um, I was in my late twenties, mid mid to late twenties, yeah. mid to late twenties, somewhere in there. That's typically when it starts to really matter. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I was. I don't think I'd quite hit thirty yet, but I think I was approaching thirty. Um, you know, I I won our state title without even ever having having ever used testosterone. You know, um, which you know nowadays, you know, if I if I were to tell people that, they'd call me a liar. So I don't, you know, that's why I don't bring the subject up a whole lot. But um, you know, I, you know, that old saying that all the stuff that people used to get back in the old days is a lot better than the stuff nowadays. I 100% agree with that. Your training is a big part of um, your allure. I think. People even pay you just to train them without doing any diet or anything else. Yeah, a lot of people do. Which I think is like unique. I don't think there's anybody else that has that that does diet that does anything else. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's a uh, it's a unique thing. So, can you describe your training philosophy in the simplest terms? Like, how how would you describe what what it is that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the sad thing for me is, um, due to the chemicals. People can have substandard diets and substandard training and still make progress. And then they come to the conclusion that training and diet just doesn't matter. And that's um, disappointing to me because it does matter. And right. what I've thought is, okay, you're going to use all those chemicals, great. But what if we had the absolute best nutrition and the absolute best training you know, we really wrapped it all together. So the training piece, um, I've just been absolutely um, just. You, tra you train harder than I think 95% of 
anybody else. You know, it's to... because I have a pretty shitty structure, and I've had a lot of weaknesses that I had to overcome. Right. And people see my pictures now, and they're like, oh, wow, this looks good, and this looks good. But you didn't see how it looked 10 years ago. Right, it wasn't it wasn't pretty bad. It wasn't nothing like it is now. And I didn't discover some special drug. I, I got better at training, and I got how do you, better at nutrition. Um, I, how do you offset the risk of injury with training that hard? Well, I'll get a, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about my training. Um, it's evolved over the years, and it continues to evolve. As I learn things, I build them into my programs. I've built 17 12-week programs. Uh, I'm always building new programs. And I, it's, you know, I'm always learning. So I'm always talking to people that I work with. You know, I work with Fouad, for instance, for his last show training. Yeah. And in a short period of time, all of a sudden his hamstrings started popping out, you know. So it's really cool seeing guys that are on a good nutrition plan, watching how they can really grow. Um, when their training is set up a certain way. So my training, like a session, is there's two kinds of sessions. There's what I call base days, um, <clears throat> which involve, uh, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but here's how I would break it down. You do an exercise to kind of get blood into a muscle that's non-joint traumatizing. Then you do uh, a heavier compound movement. Your joints are warmed up. This you're not you're pretty exhausting, really. Kind of. You're, it's not a like for chess, for instance. A true pre exhaust would be like flies. It, okay. And then do a uh, bench press. I'm talking about maybe you do a dumbbell press or a machine press or a hammer press. So it's not a true. But you do it in a met in a manner that's more pumping. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. And I'm doing that for two reasons. I'm trying to. I put some nutrition in me. Um, certain nutrients, broken down proteins and carbs with, with low osmolarity to suck right in your muscle. I put that, I start putting that in me before I train. So that's delivering nutrients into the muscle while I'm training. And it's putting me in a good position to do the compound movements without injuring myself. Right. Because um, you don't have to go max. Exactly. You know, you come out of the gates and you bench heavy. And if all you can think about is progressive resistance, I'm going to tell you that it's only a matter of time before you get injured, you beat up. I have four torn muscles, so I completely don't even train for, like, strength at all anymore. It, well, you know, there's so many ways to create hypertrophy. Um, you know, there's so many different ways. So my third movement would be something then where we're really employing kind of the high-intensity things that i do you know this is what you see on the videos like you know like a drop set or something with iso holds iso tension the really yeah. intense stuff that just you're, you're looking for a longer duration of a set is that yeah I'm, I'm yeah i am and i'm trying to i call it the super max pump phase i'm trying to pump the muscle as absolutely crazy as i can okay. so full of blood you can't even move it okay and then we finish off um, the body part with doing something that's um, it's more of a stretching in nature. Yep. For instance, let's say your hamstrings and your legs are super pumped, then you would finish with like say a stiff legged deadlift. Um, mm -hmm. You know this combination I found works unbelievable. Um, that's how the base days are set up, and we do three base days like that. Arms are kind of their own animal, but you know so you'll have a leg day, you'll have a chest and shoulder day, and you'll have a back day that are set up like that, arms are a little different. The arm work we do is all pumping. I, I don't believe in doing progressive resistance very much right. at all on arms because... Yeah, I, I don't even try to progress. It's like good, goodbye, right. to, you know, hello tendonitis. Um, yeah, totally. Lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, you'll, you'll get it all. Um, and then later, in the, so, so let's assume that you've mastered your pre-workout nutrition and not getting sore. So then you come back and you do what I call pumping days, where you where you're only really using that third phase, you're just trying to pump the muscle. It's um, it doesn't drain your CNS. You know, I have people say, oh right. man, you're training seven days a week, you're killing your CNS. No, I'm not. Three days are really really hard. The other four days are more pumping in nature. Um, they facilitate healing, blood flow, um, and it also creates another anabolic anabolic opportunity for you to grow. Every time right. you train, even though training is inherently catabolic. It's an anabolic opportunity, provided. So is, that, is that like a seven? You train seven days a week. Or? Most most people, I start them at four, and then as their recovery improves, I add optional days, 
uh, to, to correspond with their weak body parts. So, like, if you told me, John, my back is weak, the, the fifth day would be a back work, it would be the, an extra back workout. Gotcha. Uh, most people, I take the six days. And when we, when we do go up to seven days, I don't do it long term. I still will do it maybe six weeks, eight weeks, and then I'll pull back. I still try to periodize everything. Periodization to me is um, most people don't need to do it because they don't even train hard enough. It's like, what are you trying to? You know, I hear people deloading and periodizing. And I look at their program I'm like, what are you deloading? You didn't train hard enough to even need a deload. Right, right. Um, but I do believe, you know, if you're training like this, this this frequently, you do have to have some periodization. So we pull back the days. We might go back to four for a while. When you're coming into a show, you you've got to pull back at some point too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And even for the muscle to load with glycogen, you have to pull back that last week for sure. Um, so the last seven to ten days, I might have people pull back and not take anything to failure, um, just so the muscle's nice and fresh. And it can load and not look quite so beat up. The cattle prods had to be a gimmick. It was. A, we were just having fun, man. <laughs> oh my god! I saw that and I, I I texted Zach, who's our IT guy, and I I was like, this can't be real. It was real. No, I know it was real, but I was like, this can't be a thing that. <laughs> but was it like, wasn't a training actually... technique. It was a fun. No. Oh, okay. Good. Good. <laughs> no, we were yeah. just having a good time. The one where I got we're... zapped in each lat, both lats at the same time, that one stung. <laughs> Were you doing like you were doing like bent over barbell rows yeah. or something supported? Yeah, yeah, that was pretty ridiculous. Well, that was a good one. That one uh, put pretty good shock through me. <laughs> yep. All right. So the last last thing. This is kind of a personal question for me because I'm in this spot myself. Um, balancing family life with being a bodybuilder and a workaholic, <clears throat> which I know you are. Um, any tips to keep me married? I get married in September, and I have four businesses. <laughs> okay. This is one of them, and this is just, you know, a passion and a hobby. It's not really a business at this point. Um, the Built by Metal page, um, maybe someday it'll become profitable, but right now I just want to do it. But uh, it's kind of how I am, and I think I see that a little bit in, in you and some other guys that do this type of work where we just don't stop. Yeah. Yeah, I yes, I actually worked every single day last year except Christmas Day. And, yeah, and, and when I say I worked is, every day, I did. I don't mean three or four hours. I mean seven right. to ten to twelve hours. So, I don't know if you're on Instagram at all, but Fakri is on Instagram, and he always puts up a picture of himself, you know, falling asleep at his plate, and it says something like 140 hours work this week. And we just yeah. make fun of it constantly because it's ridiculous. Well, but I've seen his pictures in the hospital too, where he put himself in a hospital or something. Was- <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it's it's re- even if it's hyperbole, it's reflective of like what is, I'm not gonna say good coaches, but people who are really dedicated. You're just you just have so much to do. Yeah. And you can't put the phone down. You can't put the laptop down. You just can't do it. Yeah, so- you know what? Um, it comes down to priorities. Um, last year was a really busy year for me, but I'm not proud of the fact that I worked that many hours. I'm not proud of that. I don't think that's a good thing. I'm not bragging, right. saying, hey, look how tough I am, everybody. Um, I worked in a corporate job, which involved plenty of overtime. Uh, right. You know, I was traveling around the country working for Chase Bank, and I still trained. I never missed a workout. I never missed a meal. I still, and you know what, man? Uh, life can fly by. And, you know, I, um, last year I tried really hard to control my business because I didn't want to be that busy. I wanted to, I've got two five-year-olds and I've got a wife and I wanted to do more with them. And as hard as I tried, I kept raising my prices. That didn't work. I, um, <laughs> you know, I, That's a good problem. I was doing everything I could to have less business. But when somebody hires me, I give them my full attention. Right. So right. Absolutely. I'm not going to become like one of these other guys that just sends, you know, you know, that doesn't even track anything really. I mean, my, the stuff that I do is really detailed. The training is incredibly detailed. The diet's incredibly detailed. That's right. just how I operate. I would rather work with less people and have a better reputation. So, you know, I kept, I started, um, hiring folks. I hired a couple guys that I really think a lot of, uh, Matt Berzikot's one of them that I just recently hired. Matt's a 
Yeah, we actually talked to Matt. Um, okay, all right. Zach lives in his town, and he saw him at the gym last night, and they, they, they mentioned that he's going to be training with you and at uh, Elite FTS. So we, we really like Matt a lot. He's a good guy, and I've got to know Matt, and we've discussed philosophy on training and nutrition, and we really see eye to eye on this stuff. And it was important to me to hire somebody that had an ideology that's similar to mine. I don't want right. to dilute the brand, you know, as they, as they call it. But I also wanted somebody with char- with the character that would, um, you know, somebody who would really take care of people and have good experiences right. with people. They can't all be good, but you can always do your best for it to be good. So this was my attempt. It, you know, people are like, well, what are you trying to do, take over the world? No, I'm trying to get a life. I'm trying to have a life. Right. Right. You know, I'm trying to spend more time with my family. I'm trying to take vacations with my family, which I haven't been able to do this year yet, but I'm going to. Um, I have scaled my hours back, um, and and I'm and I I'm very happy about that. Um, and I would say I, by the end of the year, there's a chance I might hire two more people. Um, it's not a, it's not to have a bazillion clients. It's, you know, there's certainly the business part of it. And I'm a pretty good business guy. However. A lot of it, you know, you real as you get older, you realize more and more the value of time. You know, right. Five years ago, somebody said, "Hey, I can't do this exercise, this exercise, this exercise, and this one. I can't eat this and this and this. Can you build me a custom program?" You know, I would say, "Sure." Now I think about it. Okay, this is going to probably take me four or five hours. This might take me ten hours. What could I be doing in other three or four hours? Where am I going to take that time from? Okay, the right. only time I have left on my calendar is my kid's t-ball game. So is this right. worth? So you start to realize the value of every single hour of your day. Right. And money becomes so less important. Well, especially when you're doing okay. Yeah, I mean, provided, yeah, I mean, that's that's reality. Provided you financially. It, it becomes a lot more important the less you have. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and honestly, financially, I, I, do, I do well. So. You must if you left the bank, Jim. Um, yeah, you know, I I, I kind of laugh. I um, <laughs> I was so scared to do that. I'm a really conservative person, but I but anyway. So, you know, you just look at the value of time. And one of the things that I, you know, I mentor a lot of people. I actually have an intern with me here now. But one of the things I tell people: if you compete, and I learned this the hard way myself. Every a lot of the ninety nine percent of the stuff that I teach people is because I screwed something up myself and I, I tried to learn my sure. lesson. So when you compete, be honest with the person that you're with and just tell them, you know what, this next four to six weeks is going to be really hard. I'm going to be really tired. I'm not going to want to be real social, but just please back me up. And when this show's over. You're going to be so happy. I'm going to take such good care of you. So that's kind of what my message is to people. Don't let their spouse or their girlfriend or boyfriend second, you know, wonder what's going on. Tell them. Just tell them. This is what to expect. Yeah. No, you have to. And just people don't do that. And then when the show is over, man, you better shower them with attention. Yeah, you you got to drop off the. uh, It's the right thing to do, you know? Intensity, yeah. It's the right thing to do. You can't expect. You can't, you know, and bodybuilders are very, very, and I am too, we're very selfish by nature, very selfish. You can't expect the whole life, your whole life and every, your family, you can't expect everything to always revolve around you. You can't expect for someone to support you if you never support them. So I ask for support, you know, can I, you know, I ask my wife all the time, do you mind if I take a nap? She knows I'm not being lazy. She knows I literally can't keep my eyes open. Right, right. And then when the show's over, you know, you know, we'll she's got a lot of friends. We'll we'll go hang out with her friends. We'll go do more stuff with the kids. I mean, we really we start really doing a lot more. Oh, that that brings me to an important question. You mentioned being retired after the show. Yeah, is that a reality? Well, does anyone ever retire from bodybuilding? Ah, uh, that's a good question. What I don't want to do is I don't want to be those guys that competes when their body is going backwards. Yeah, and so far, knock on wood, I'm actually still progressing. Um, which is, I'm 42. So are you doing Masters Nationals? Um, I'm going to do the Team Universe, and, yeah. and I hope to win. But if I don't win, I'll do Masters Nationals, and then if I don't win that, you know, there's so, probably a pretty good chance I won't compete anymore. So okay, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's been enough chance opportunities for you to have won a card where it's like how much better did you need to be, really? Exactly. Yeah, I'm. I mean, how, what, I mean, I think what I'm doing with my structure is I'm not sure how much more I can do. 